All right, so today we're going to read chapter six of Hoot. We're working right through the book. At breakfast the next morning, morning, Roy asked if it was against the law for a kid his age not to go to school. His mother said, well, I'm not sure if it's an actual law, but oh yeah, it is, his father cut in. Truancy is what it's called. Can they put you in jail, Roy asked. Usually they just put you back in school, Mr. Eberhardt said. Half joking, he added, you weren't thinking of dropping out, were you? Roy said no, school was all right. I bet you know what this is about, Mrs. Eberhardt said. You're worried about bumping into this Matherson boy again. See, didn't I tell you that apology letter was too assertive? The letter was just fine, Roy's father said, spreading open the newspaper. If it was just fine, then why is Roy so scared? Why is he thinking about dropping out of school? I'm not scared. I'm not thinking of dropping out. It's just, his mother eyeballed him. What? Nothing, Mom. Roy decided not to tell his parents about his encounter with Mullet Fingers, the running boy. Being in law enforcement, Roy's father probably was required to report all crimes, even truancy. Roy didn't want the kid to get, kid, get in trouble. Listen to this, Mr. Eberhardt said, and began reading aloud from the newspaper. A Coconut Cove police cruiser was vandalized early Monday morning while parked at a construction site on East Oriel Avenue. The police officer had fallen asleep inside the car at the time, according to the police spokesperson. Can you believe that? Roy's mother clucked, sleeping on duty, that's disgraceful. They should fire that fellow. Roy thought the story was pretty amusing. It gets better, his father said. Listen, the incident happened shortly before sunrise when an unknown prankster sneaked up in the patrol car, a 2001 Chrome Victoria, and spray painted the windows with black paint. Roy, who had a mouthful of brazen, raisin bran, burst out laughing, milk dribbled down his chin. Mr. Eberhardt was also smiling as he continued. Coconut Cove Police Chief, Mural Deacon declined to release the name of the officer who fell asleep, saying that he is part of a special surveillance team investigating property crimes on the east side of town. Deacon said that the officer had recently been ill with the flu and had been given medication that made him drowsy. Roy's father looked up from the article. Medication, ha. Huh? What else does the story say, Mrs. Eberhardt asked. Let's see. It says that the third suspicious incident within a week at this location, which is the future home of Mother Paula's All-American Pancake House. Roy's mother brightened. We're getting a Mother Paula's here in Coconut Grove. That'll be nice. Roy swapped a napkin across his chin. Dad, what else happened there? I was wondering the same thing, Mr. Eberhardt. Skim the rest of the article. Here it is. Last Monday, unknown intruders uprooted survey stakes from the property. Four days later, vandals entered the site and placed live alligators in three portable toilets. According to the police, the reptiles were captured unharmed and later released into a nearby canal. No arrests have been made. Miss Eberhardt rose and started clearing the breakfast dishes. Alligator, she said. Good heavens, what next? Mr. Eberhardt folded his paper and tossed it on the kitchen counter. This is turning out to be an interesting little town after all, isn't it, Roy? Roy picked up the newspaper to see for himself. East Oriel Avenue sounded familiar. As he read the story, Roy remembered where he'd seen that street sign. Beatrice Leap's bus stop. The place he had first spotted the running boy was on West Oriel Avenue, just on the other side of the main highway. The article doesn't say how big those gators were, Roy remarked. His father chuckled. I don't think it's important, son. I think it's the thought that counts. The police captain said, I've read your report, David. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Officer Delinko shook his head. His hands were folded on his lap. What could he say? His sergeant spoke up. David understands how serious this is. Embarrassing is the word, the captain said. The chief has been sharing some of the emails and phone messages with me. It's not pretty. Did you see the newspaper? Officer Delenko nodded. He had read and reread the article a dozen times, each time it made his stomach churn. You probably noticed that your name wasn't mentioned. That's because we refused to release it to the media. Yes, uh, thank you, sir. I'm, I'm very sorry about all of this. You read Chief Deacon's explanation for what happened. I assume you're comfortable with that. To be honest, sir, I haven't had the flu and I wasn't taking any medication yesterday. David, the sergeant cut in. If the chief says you were taking flu medication, then you were taking flu medication. And if the chief said that's why you fall asleep in your patrol car, then that's exactly what happened. Understand? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The captain held up a yellow slip of paper. This is a bill for the Ford dealership for 410 bucks. That's what got the black paint off your windows. That's the good news. Took them all day, but they did it. Officer Julica was sure that the captain was going to hand him the repair bill, but he didn't. Instead, he placed it inside the patrolman's personnel file, which lay open on his desk. Officer, I don't know what to do with you. I just don't. The captain's tone was one of paternal disappointment. 
I'm very happy. It won't ha I'm very sorry. It won't happen again, sir. Officer Delinko Sergeant said, Captain, I ought to tell you that David volunteered for the surveillance duty at the construction site. He went out early in the morning on his off-duty time. On his own time, the captain folded his arms. Well, that's commendable. David, can I ask you why you did that? Because I wanted to catch the perpetrators, Officer Delinko replied. I knew it was a priority with you and the chief. That's the only reason you didn't have some personal stake in the case? I do now, thought Officer Delinko, now that they've made a fool of me. No, sir, he said. The captain turned his attention towards the sergeant. Well, there's got to be some kind of punishment, whether we like it or not. The chief's taking too much grief over this. I agree, the sergeant said. Officer Delinko's heart sank. Any disciplinary action would automatically become a part of his permanent record. It might be an issue when it came time for a promotion. Sir, I'll, I'll pay that bill myself, Officer Delinko offered. $410 was a serious chunk out of his paycheck, but keeping his record spotless was worth every penny. The captain said it wasn't necessary for Officer Delinko to cover the bill and that it wouldn't satisfy the chief anyways. So I'm putting you on desk duty for a month. David can live with that, said the sergeant. But what about Mother Paula's surveillance? Officer Delinko asked. Don't worry, we'll get it covered. We'll pull somebody off the midnight shift. Yes, sir. Officer Delinko was depressed at the idea of being stuck behind a desk, doing nothing for a whole month. Still, it was better than being suspended. The only thing worse than sitting at headquarters would be sitting at home. Captain stood up, which meant the meeting was over. He said, David, if anything like this ever happens again, it won't, I promise. Next time, you're definitely going to see your name in the newspaper. Yes, sir. Under a headline that says, Officer Terminated, is that clear? Officer Delinko cringed inwardly. I understand, sir, he said quietly to the captain. He wondered if the little jerks who had sprayed his crown Victoria realized how much trouble they were getting him into. My whole career is in jeopardy. Officer Delinko thought angrily because all of some smart juvenile delinquents. He was more determined than ever to catch them in the act. In the hallway outside the captain's office, the sergeant told him, you can pick up your car at the motor pool, but remember, David, you're off road patrol. That means you're allowed to drive, you're allowed to drive the unit home and back, but that's it. Right, said Officer Delinko, home and back. He'd already thought about a route that would take him directly, directly past the corner of East Royal and Woodbury, the future location of Mother Paula's All-American Pancake House. Nobody said he couldn't leave his house extra early in the morning, and no one said he couldn't take his sweet time getting home. Dana Matherson was absent from school again. Roy felt somewhat relieved, though not enough to relax. The longer Roy had to stay away so his nose could recover from a Roy's punch, the nastier he would be when he finally returned from Trace Middle. You've got time to blow, man. You've got to blow town, Garrett suggested help helpfully. I'm not running away. Whatever happens, just happens. Roy wasn't trying to act cool. He thought a lot about the Dana situation. Another confrontation seemed inevitable, and part of him simply wanted to get it over with. He wasn't cocky, but he had a stubborn streak of pride, and he had no intention of spending the rest of the year cowering in the restroom or sneaking through the halls just to avoid some dumb bully. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but some of the kids are taking bets. Great, they're betting on whether or not Dana's going to beat me up. No, they're betting on how many times he's going to beat you up. Nice, said Roy. Actually, two good things have come out of the altercation with Roy Matherson. The first was Roy was successfully trailing the barefoot boy to the golf course. The second was Roy being booted off the bus for two weeks by the vice principal. It was nice having his mother pick him up at school. They got to chat in the car, and Roy arrived home 20 minutes earlier than usual. The phone was ringing when they walked in the door, and it was Roy's sister calling from California to chat. Roy's mother's sister calling from California to chat. Roy seized the opportunity to retrieve a cardboard shoebox from his room and quietly slip out the back door of the house. He was heading for the golf course again, except this time with a slight detour. Instead of taking a left on West Oriole, heading towards the bus stop, Roy rode his bicycle across the highway to East Oriole. He'd gone less than two blocks when he came upon a scrub-covered lot with dented work trailer in one corner. Parked beside the trailer was a blue pickup truck. Not far away sat three bulldozer-type vehicles and a row of portable toilets. Roy figured this had to be the same place where the police car got spray-painted and the alligators were hidden inside the latrines. As soon as Roy stopped his bicycle, the door of the trailer flew open and a stocky man charged out. He wore stiff tan work pants and a tan shirt that had a name stitched to the breast. Roy was too far away to read it. What do you want? The Roy snapped, his face flash <laughs> flushed with anger. Hey kid, I'm talking to you. Roy thought, what's his problem? The man came toward him, pointing. What's in the box? What do you and your little buddies got planned for tonight, huh? Roy spun his bicycle around and started pedaling away. The guy was acting like a total psycho. 
That's right, and you don't come back, the bald man howled, shaking a fist. Next time there'll be guard dogs waiting for you, the meanest dogs you ever saw. Roy pedaled faster. He didn't turn around. The clouds were darkening, and he thought he saw a raindrop on one cheek. From the distance came a rumble of thunder. Even after crossing the highway to West Oriel, Roy didn't slow his pace. By the time he made it to the golf course, a steady drizzle was coming down. He hopped off his bicycle and, shielding the shoebox with both hands, began to jog across the deserted greens and fairways. As soon as he reached the thicket of pepper trees where he encountered the boy called Mullet Fingers, Roy had mentally prepared himself to be blindfolded and tied up again. He'd even composed a short speech for the occasion. He was determined to persuade Mullet Fingers that he, had to be, that he was someone to be trusted, and he hadn't come to interfere, but rather to help if he needed it. While working his way through the thicket, Roy grabbed a dead branch off the ground. It was heavy enough to make an impression on a cotton milk moccasin, though he hoped that wouldn't be necessary. When he got to the ditch, he saw no signs of deadly sparkle-tailed snakes. The running boy's camp was gone, cleaned out. All the plastic bags had been removed and the fire pit had been buried. Roy poked the tip of the dead branch through the loose dirt, but it yielded no clues. Glumly, he checked for footprints and found not one. Mullet fingers had fled without a trace. As Roy emerged from the fairway, the purple sky opened up. Rain splashed down in the wind-driven sheets that stung his face, and lightning crashed nearby. Roy shivered and took off running. In an electrical storm, the worst place to be is on a golf course, standing near trees. As he ran, he flinched every thundercrap, thunderclap. He began to feel guilty about sneaking away from the house. His mother would be worried sick when she realized he was out in this weather. She might even get in the car and come searching for him, a prospect that troubled Roy. He didn't want his mom driving around in such dangerous conditions. The rain was so heavy that she wouldn't be able to see the road very well. As wet and weary as he was, Roy forced himself to run faster. Squinting through the downpour, he kept thinking it can't be much further. He was looking for a water fountain where he'd left his bicycle. Finally, another wild burst of lightning illuminated the fairway. He spotted it 20 yards ahead of him, but his bicycle wasn't there. At first, Roy thought it was the wrong fountain. He thought he might have lost his direction in the storm. Then he recognized a nearby, ut nearby utility shed in a wooden kiosk with a soda machine. This was the place, all right. Roy stood in the rain and stared miserably at the spot where he'd left his bike. Usually he was careful about locking it, but today he'd been in too much of a hurry. Now it was missing, stolen undoubtedly. To get away from the rain, Roy dashed into the wooden kiosk. The soggy cardboard box was coming apart in his hands, and he knew it was going to be a really long walk home. He knew he wouldn't get there before nightfall, and his parents were going to be going bananas. For ten minutes, Roy stood in the kiosk, dripping on the floor, waiting for the downpour to stop. The lightning and thunder seemed to be rolling eastward, but the rain just wouldn't quit. Finally, Roy stepped outside. He lowered his head and started trudging in the direction of his neighborhood. Every step made a splash. Raindrops streaked down his forehead and clung to his eyelashes. He wished he'd worn a cap. When he got to the sidewalk, he tried to run, but it was like sloshing through the shallows of an endless lake. Roy had noticed this about Florida. It was so low and flat that it took forever to drain. He plodded onward, and soon he reached the bus stop where he'd first spotted the running boy. Roy didn't pause to look around. It was growing darker by the minute. Just as he made it to the corner of West Oriole and the highway, the streetlights flicked on. Oh, brother, he thought, I'm really late. Traffic was steady in both directions, creeping through the standing water. Roy waited impatiently. Every car pushed a wake that splashed against his shins. He didn't care. He was already soaked to the bone. Spying a gap in traffic, Roy ventured into the road. Watch it, a voice shouted behind him. Roy jumped back from the curb and spun around. There was Beatrice Leap sitting on his bicycle. She said, what's in the shoebox, cowgirl? Let me pull up eight questions. All right, chapter six, reading comprehension questions. Question one, what was the weather like in this chapter? I'm thinking mostly towards the end of the chapter when he was trying to get home. And two, what was stolen from Roy? All right. So that was chapter six. Thanks for reading with me today.